guaranteed superior performance. In the next segment, we'll look at how to implement this process. Gracias, señor Finnegan. Thank you, Mr. Finnegan. We continue with our question and answer series. Session. We will hope and wait for all the persons who are listening to us so that you will send them. We're going to read one that comes from Guayaquil, Guayaquil Ecuador. In, a, in an innovative business process, what comes first, a change in organization structure or in quality? Um, Good question, a little difficult to answer. Uh, first of all, quality, I believe, should be defined as meeting the customer's requirements. Uh, and I don't think you can have a quality in an organization unless you understand uh, what your customers require, what they expect, uh, what they're willing to pay for. Um, the work processes that you put in place to assure that you deliver your customers' requirements Benchmarking is uh, perhaps one of the more realistic and practical means of finding the very best practices that can help you implement the kinds of work processes that will deliver your customers' requirements the first time. Um, I hope that's uh, helpful to the questioner. Another call from Ecuador. Is it necessary for companies to have a specialist or should they use consultants? Yeah, very good question. We'll, we'll spend some time talking about that uh, in the next segment. But uh, organizations um, uh, are probably, there are going to be occasions when it's necessary to use a consultant. Uh, a good example of that would be compensation studies, which all of our organizations do today. Uh, and we usually do that through a third party. Uh, consultants uh, are valuable uh, when um, uh, the kind of information that you want to gather um, or, the, or the organizations who wish to participate wish to remain anonymous to one another. Um, but because the object again is to establish objectives to implement in your own organization, uh, I think I would advocate that to the degree that you can use your own people, particularly the people who are going to have to implement those changes, that, that you will probably have more success. And that is not uh, to say that consultants are not valuable. Uh, there may be occasions when, when you will need to use one. Thank you very much. Another call from Monterrey, Mexico, the Technological Institute. Good morning. As we look at the NAFTA agreement between USA, Canada, and Mexico, how important could it be to companies to utilize the benchmarking uh, technique? That's it. Um, I don't know that I'm qualified to make any comment about, about NAFTA at all. Uh, Certainly that would enhance, I would suspect, uh, the ability of, of uh, companies and organizations across the borders of all three nations to, uh, to, to establish partnerships for the purposes of exchanging information. But uh, even without NAFTA, that possibility, uh, not only a possibility, that reality does exist today. Um, there, are, uh, there are organizations uh, in, in Monterey who are uh, engaged in um, uh, coordinating benchmarking studies within Mexico as well as with, uh, between Mexico and the United States. And I'll make some comments about that in, in, in a moment in the next section. Um, but I, I, I would certainly say that it's compatible with the objectives of NAFTA, but it's certainly not dependent upon it. Thank you. We have another call, but first we will ask one that has been sent by fax. At what level, at what management level, must you begin the implementation of benchmarking within a company? It comes from the Technical Institute in Tuxtla Gutierrez, Mexico. That, that's a very good question. Um, 
The answer to that question is the same as the answer if you were to ask me, can you implement uh, total quality uh, without uh, senior management uh, uh, involvement or approval? You can implement benchmarking at any management level where management has the ability and the control of their operation to be able to implement what they learn. If the implementation or the change in the organization is going to require more senior management involvement, uh, then that level of management from the very beginning has to approve what's taking place. Um, I think as I, I said a few minutes ago, and I know that I will reiterate before we finish this program, um, the involvement of senior management ultimately uh, is required in order to be successful. But you certainly can begin the process, at least as a demonstration project, uh, in your own operations, um, and on that basis, get senior management approval. Gracias. Seguimos con atendiendo las líneas telefónicas de Culiacán, Sinaloa. From Culiacán, México, we have another question. Good morning. The question is this: What strategy do you recommend? to achieve that a company that has a good process and that want, they want to incorporate, what strategy do you recommend to know the basis of the success and for a company in Latin America? Well, if I understand the question correctly, um, as I think I've, I've said, when you do benchmarking and you gather data, you're going to find um, that the, the gap data, the metrics tell you that the benchmark is either the company that you or the, one of the companies that you have gathered information from, or that you are at a par or parity with, the, um, with that, that ben benchmark company. Or, in fact, you may be the superior organization. You may have superiority. Um, and the object is to find out exactly uh, where you are against that, that benchmark or that, that measure. Um, how an organization uses that data uh, depends upon partly the, the strategy of the organization itself. Um, Remember what I said a moment ago was equality is meeting the customer's requirements. An organization that has established a process that is the benchmark, that has superiority, uh, needs to also take a look at whether or not uh, the investments that are required to maintain that position uh, exceed what the customer requires. So being the uh, superior organization is certainly the goal, but maybe uh, not always to be so out in front of the, par uh, the pack. Gracias. Tenemos otra llamada de México del Instituto. Another call from Mexico de Querétaro. from the Institute. Queremos preguntar. We want to ask. Capacitación para el futuro. Podemos usar training for the future. Para manejar la productividad. Can you use benchmarking to for a state organization in order to train their personnel? Um. If I heard that correctly, uh, can, can benchmarking be used for a, uh, a state or a, a public organization, first of all? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Um, there are many, many processes that we have in, in all of our organizations, public and private, uh, that are uh, generic and very common to one another. Um, the obvious ones, we all uh, uh, pay bills. Uh, we all uh, have payroll systems. We all have various administrative work processes. So, yes, all of those things uh, could be established and could be benchmarked. If I, the second part of the question, if I understood it correctly, uh, can, can people in uh, public organizations be trained on this process? Uh, and the answer to that, again, is yes. Uh, and the real learning of any, any cooperative process like this is really in the doing and the practice itself. Thank you very much for your questions and participation. Now, Mr. Finnegan will continue with the third part of his presentation.
About now, some of you, I am sure, are thinking, why should we worry about a formal process for conducting benchmarking studies? Why can't we just visit those companies that we know are outstanding and learn our lessons quickly? The simple answer is that it just doesn't work that way. Before you ever get to a site visit, there's some serious work to be done. That is what we will cover in this session. What has to be done and what is required to be successful. In his book, The Benchmarking Workbook, Gregory Watson describes an experience that he had at Compaq. A Fortune 100 company that had just started benchmarking requested to benchmark Compaq and Watson agreed to participate. He learned later that the company had selected only Compaq as a partner and had submitted a questionnaire of 57 questions. They planned to have answered in a four-hour face-to-face meeting. That would allow only for four-minute responses per question and no time for discussion or follow-up. Watson contrasted this approach with that of Xerox, who wanted to benchmark Compaq on a similar subject. Xerox submitted only 11 questions to be discussed during an eight-hour session. The distinction between these two examples is a combination of both benchmarking experience and the ability to follow a standard process. The value of following a standard process when conducting a benchmarking study is that the resulting information will have a higher quality because it is targeted more to your company's specific needs. There are a number of different processes and benchmarking models that are available for you to use. Here's just a sampling of the different kinds of approaches. There is, of course, the original 10-step process developed by Xerox, but there's also a variety of similar processes, AT&T's nine steps, Alcoa's six steps, and many others. As I mentioned when we started, there is simply not enough time to provide you the detail of training you will need to start using one of these processes. We will review one process generally, but I urge you to get formal training. Training is available from a number of sources. The Quality and Productivity Center in Houston, Texas. Public training organizations such as Technology Training Corporation of Mexico. Universities like Caltech. UCLA, and San Diego State. And a variety of TQM organizations provide such training for a fee, such as Xerox, Federal Express, and Florida Power and Light. For additional sources, contact Centro de Productividad de Monterrey, AC. A solid benchmarking process will cover at least four phases. One, planning taking the steps to get ready to conduct a study, analysis, processing the data once it has been acquired, integration, communicating results and developing goals to close the benchmarking gaps, and fourth, action, implementing the action plans that will achieve the goals and establishing methods for monitoring progress. Let's look at each of these phases in detail. Planning consists of determining what subject will be benchmarked, who will be your partners, and how you will collect the data. Sounds easy. It is easy to understand, but it is somewhat more difficult to implement. What will be benchmarked? Remember, the focus is on a work process. Which of your work processes are the most critical to the overall success of your operation? Do you measure, measure customer satisfaction? What has that data taught you about critical work processes? Some examples of subjects that could be benchmarked are market share, unit manufacturing costs, product delivery process, and product quality. I'm sure you have other ideas of how to select subjects that are critical to your company. But you, before you make your final selection, you will have to select a measurement. The measurement you select will not only provide the metrics, but also help define the benchmarking subject. As an example, if you choose product quality, what do you want to measure? Reliability? Mean time to repair? Repair costs. Then, once you know what you want to benchmark and how you are going to measure it, document the work process you want to benchmark. This is best done by a flow chart in as much detail as possible, reflecting all the process steps, inputs and outputs, 
and measures for each step in the work process. The people who perform this work process should be involved in determining if all the steps have been included. Some questions to ask yourself are, how important is this subject to my supplier customer chain? How important is this subject to the work process we are evaluating? Is there someone in management who agrees that this is important and will support implementing the changes on the basis of the study results? Said another way, is there a champion, an advocate for this benchmarking study on the next level of management? Finally, put the purpose of the study into a narrative statement. This is the touchstone you will use to make sure your work remains on target, a sort of mission statement for the study. Such a statement should include the process output and the customers. The next step is to identify potential partners. Certainly your competitors come readily to mind, but you should still ask your customers who they think the up-and-coming suppliers are, and your own suppliers can tell you something about their customers. Another excellent source for partners is the public domain. Sources like trade journals, association lists, and analysis, and government reports, and industry analysis. The next planning step is to determine how you will gather the data. As we discussed earlier, this will be partly affected by whether your study is internal, competitive, or functional. Or you may want to pursue a performance benchmark based solely on research or gather a group of competitors to partner in a study. Or you may want to make a site visit of the best of the best. The final planning step is to develop a questionnaire, a list of the questions you want to ask your partners. In developing your questionnaire, remember two things. First, the compact story about the value of 11 questions versus 57. And second, can you answer your own questions? By answering your own questions, you may discover that the data is not as easy to obtain as you thought. If you can't answer your questions, don't expect anyone else to. Also, you will need your answers as a base point to compare the results from your partners. This is a good place to make an important point about benchmarking. Because effective benchmarking requires the careful building of an environment of trust, cooperation, and learning between organizations. Developing such mutual re respect requires more than a common process. It requires a shared understanding of ethical guidelines. Some of the principles I recommend are, do not ask others to tell you things you would not be willing to reciprocate with. Do not misrepresent yourself or your company. Respect another's proprietary rights. Always review your company's ethics policy before starting benchmarking and talk to your legal staff before visiting another company. The next phase is analysis. What does the study data tell you? Is the competition better? If so, how much better? Why are they better? And what have I learned that I can put into action to improve my operations? The first step is to tabulate the data and determine if your partners are better than you. The chances are you will gather more data than you need. So to avoid analysis paralysis, sort the data based on your purpose statement and focus only on the information related to the study. Use simple computations. Your guide should be to be roughly right. Don't get bogged down in the fine detail just determine who the data says is best. Put the data into formats that tell the story most clearly, like the seven statistical tools of quality, histograms, Pareto charts, pie charts, etc. And look for key messages in the anecdotal information. Identifying the performance gap is quite simple. Compare your own internal measurement data against the benchmark, making sure that there is consistency between your internal data and the data collected from your partners. The delta between your performance and the benchmark is the gap. There will be three kinds of gaps. Negative, when the external practices are better. Parity, when there is no significant difference between you and your partners. And positive, 
when your internal practices are superior. Hopefully during your data gathering you have paid attention to what kind of drivers may be at work within your partner's organizations. If you have done a good study, then you have a feel for why the superior benchmark is the best. What is driving the superior performance? Some things that should be considered are business practices, work processes, work standards, the work environment, economics in the industry or the partner's country, culture. Some of it may be national culture, but also look at the culture within the organization. Let me give you an example of the importance of drivers. When Xerox first benchmarked engineering productivity in Japan, we were stunned. Japanese productivity is measured by such things as drawings per engineer and lines of code per software engineer, indicated an overwhelming superiority by our Japanese partners, including our own affiliate, Fuji Xerox. What was not readily apparent until you started looking for the root causes, the drivers, was that the manpower numbers we looked at did not include the temporary workforce which can be as high as 40% in some Japanese companies. Also, our Japanese counterparts had made a concerted effort over several years to make capital investments in their engineering staff, investments we had not made. Instead of concluding our engineers did not work hard enough, we knew that we would have to provide investments in design aids as well as revisit our partners to assess the impact of their temporary workforce. Your assessment of why will also have to include projecting the gap based on expected future performance and trends. This relates to the trends that you can observe and is generally expressed in terms of the percentage. Such an assessment might sound like, currently our company has a 5% gap versus the benchmark in product quality. However, industry trends show an improvement of 1% per year. Therefore, the projected gap will be 10% in five years unless corrective action is taken. The third phase is integration. This is the phase where we communicate the results and determine what actions to take. In planning your communications, it is important to understand the audience and how the study may affect them. Management, for example, will need to know the basis for the new benchmarks in order to buy into their rationale. Employees whose work processes may change will need to be informed of the changes and their support solicited. Suppliers may be affected and if end user customers are directly affected they will both need to understand the change in processes. Second, although an executive review or presentation will probably be required it is advisable to meet with the senior managers and employees most affected in one-on-one -on -one reviews. Let them see the data before it is presented. Give them an opportunity to influence the recommendations. It will go a long way to assure their support. Goals are a statement of planned performance. To close benchmarking gaps, goals will have to be changed. The best approach is to re-examine the rationale for your mission statement, your operating principles, and your performance goals, that is, your strategies and tactics. Then re-examine your current goals based on the benchmarking data and adjust your long-range plans to accommodate new annual goals that will allow you to reach the benchmark. Also, don't forget annual performance measures and reward systems that will support the new goals. You might also find that you diffuse some of the resistance to benchmarking findings when they are converted into planning statements. Some of you may call that operating principles. As an example, statements like provide competitive levels of customer satisfaction by market segment or reduce unit costs are non-threatening statements because they are not specific to any one organization, position, or individual. For that reason, operating principles can be discussed openly and understood across organizational boundaries, in turn making goal setting easier. The final phase is where the action plans are implemented and monitored. 
And this is where an organization's creativity for solving problems can be applied. To do this, the activities or tasks that have to be accomplished to address the gaps have to be identified along with how the organization's support will be obtained. To effect the necessary changes, the new practices or process changes have to be clearly defined and the responsibilities, roles, and rewards stated. It helps to use some kind of project management tool. Benchmarking companies have learned that two non-traditional methods are often more productive when making significant process changes. One is to use a process czar, a single person to own the project, who is empowered to acquire and manage cross-functional resources. This works great for processes affecting end-user customers like order entry, billing, and service. A second method is a performance team, ideally the team who owns the work process. This is especially effective when they have been involved in the benchmarking study from the beginning because they know why they are adopting an industry best practice as their own work process. Monitoring the action plan is essential to get the results you want. Dave Kearns, Xerox's chief executive officer, used to say that we could expect what you inspect. Inspection of the action plans is an important part of benchmarking. It is best accomplished by integrating benchmarking right into an organization's key business processes, like planning, management process, quality, etc. In other words, establishing your goals and plans on the basis of external facts and conducting periodic reviews, including the performance reviews of accountable persons. A recalibration process must be installed to ensure that benchmarks are reevaluated and updated, and to ensure that they are based on the latest methods and practices. Periodically, benchmarks need to be examined to see if they are still valid in light of external changes. One approach would be to recalibrate the critical benchmarks annually. Recalibration should include surveys and interviews of study participants, managers, and employees who have, been, who have implemented actions based on benchmarks to assess their attitude and behavioral issues. Part of that assessment should include the effect of the most common pitfalls in the process. These are some of the most common pitfalls. Unclear purpose statement. Trivial studies or trying to do too much. Failing to get management's buy-in to do the study so they are surprised by the results. Not partnering with your industry's leaders. Failing to consult with customers. Excluding companies from the study because you assume you can't get their data, rather than trying. Poor questionnaires that ask so what kinds of questions. And failing to pro probe at the work processes or practices. Not engaging the functional managers. Making site visits with only one person. It always helps to have more than one pair of eyes and ears when visiting a competitive site. Trying to be overly precise or getting bogged down in detail. Wandering from the purpose of the study and not identifying the reasons for the gap. Failing to get to the root causes. Not identifying the real drivers of a competitor's practice. Getting caught up in the study for the study's sake and defending the outcomes rather than letting the data speak for itself. And failing to have the facts to support your conclusions. Obviously, benchmarking is not easy. It is also experiential. Most of us learned by stumbling into these pitfalls. We also had to overcome our managers and our prejudices. And so will you. There are some myths about benchmarking that have to be recognized as myths. These are attitudes or beliefs that get in the way of our being successful. Focusing on targets rather than the practices. Thinking that benchmarking is a quantitative game of statistics rather than a work, pro work process improvement. Of course, putting off benchmarking until we identify the perfect company to benchmark. Believe me, there is no such company. Other myths are that staff organizations can't be benchmarked, that benchmarking can only be done 
by consultant experts. That there is no value in benchmarking internally. To be successful, I believe you have to be conscious of these pitfalls and myths. But it will help if you focus on six key requirements or enablers and to work against the six principal barriers I'm certain you will encounter. First, the requirements. One, keep your team intact throughout the study. The process is experiential and you'll lose valuable knowledge and experience with turnover. Two, remember that the value of the data you receive will only be as good as the questionnaire you prepare. Three, you will spend a lot of time in meetings planning and evaluating the purpose of the meeting and the roles that people play, like facilitator, is vitally important. Four, after site visits or telephone interviews, share notes and information with members of the team so that the key points are not missed and all the insights are identified. Five, train your partners on the process you are using so that it is standard for both of you. Finally, be certain that you have a management champion, someone to support your process and your results. Benchmarking sounds eminently logical and is quite appealing, but there are barriers to doing it well. Six particular barriers will have to be overcome if you are to succeed in benchmarking. Most of us have a lot of psychological baggage to discard before we can successfully learn from others. Perhaps the greatest is the fear of being seen as copying. From grammar school onward, we have been discouraged from working together and re rewarded for individual achievement.